A new challenger approaches. The UFC's most decorated female athlete, Amanda the Lioness Nunes, faces yet another title defense. This time at UFC 289 in Vancouver, Canada, against Mexican rising star, Irene Aldana. Plus, in the core men event, two elite lightweights face off to determine the next title challenger, as former champion Charles Dubronx Oliveira takes on Benil Dariush. UFC 289 goes down live on BT Sport 1 Saturday night. The prelims get underway from 1am with the main card from 3. Welcome back to Fight Week on BT Sport. It's your official preview for UFC 289. I'm Adam Catterall. Pleasure as always to be in your company. And it's a pleasure to be in the company of these two. Nick Pete and the Hall of Famer. Michael Bisbee. Looking forward to getting stuck into this big card from Vancouver. But before we start, Nick, just check in, right? I know that you like to do the show with the family around and the dog in the background. I know it's a little bit of a distraction. Is there anything there putting you off this week? I know that your dog, Blue, likes to get involved with the program. No, well, there's a couple of old hens clucking just outside the yeah. window. But as long as you can't hear it and only I can, then it's fine. It's fine. And no celebrities where you are, uh, Michael. I know that you obviously live in a very exclusive area of uh, <laughs> of, of California. Yeah, Orange County is very large, don't you know, Adam? No, don't be silly. Don't be silly. I've missed you, lads. It feels like it's been a long time, but fortunately, we have a we have one crazy fight card after the next coming up for the next few months. So we're gonna be busy. It's good to see you. Let's get into the card. Yeah, back end of this year is going to be absolutely crackers. And at the end of the show, we're obviously going to start talking about what's coming up at 291, 290 International Fight Week. And we'll even delve into that one that's just been announced for Sydney at UFC 293. But right now, it's all about UFC 289 Vancouver. Oh, fantastic city. The destination for this, where we've got a title fight on our hands. And it's Amanda Nunes once again in her 12th straight title fight, Mike. And this time... She's got a serious opponent on her hands. Mexican MMA is on the rise and now Rina Aldana's big ambitions of becoming the champ. Well, as you say, Mexican MMA is on the rise. Brandon Moreno champion Alexa Grasso last time out defeating Valentina Shevchenko and Grasso's teammate, Arine Aldana, looking to kind of replicate that same kind of performance, upset the world, shock the world, take the belt of the pound-for-pound pound female fighter on the planet, Amanda Nunes, bantamweight, featherweight champion. Listen, we know she uh, stumbled against Juliana Pena, but then she came back, she returned, and it was quite the beatdown. It just showed how tough Juliana Pena was, that she saw the fight belt because that fight could have been over many many times this is going to be a really really good fight and i'm very interested arena aldana has been on the rise for a long time i remember watching her back in the old fox days when the ufc was on fox around 2017 and 18 as soon as i saw her, her boxing stood out she's got a tall frame for this division and i really really believe that she is a serious viable threat to amanda nunez nick i'm giving you a loaded question here man and i'm sorry for putting you on the spot Right, because the original matchup for Amanda Nunes was, of course, the trilogy fight with Juliana Pena. And we were excited about it, of course we were. But when it fell off and this fight got made, did you actually think to yourself, this one's actually a better knock? Yeah, I think so. I think if the, if the performances would have been the other way around, i.e. Juliana Pena winning the second fight rather than the first fight, then I'd probably been a little bit more bought into it. But I think Amanda Nunes made a bit of a statement in that rematch. I wasn't too overjoyed to see them go at it a third time straight away. So I just think Aldana presents a different kind of puzzle in there as well. And I also think not only Amanda Nunes getting beat against Pena, but Valentina Shevchenko, losing to Alexa Grasso. It just seems to lit, lit a fire in both those weight divisions where I think all the women there are right. okay, listen, if that person can do it, I can absolutely do it. There was a time not too long ago, just last year, in fact, when Amanda Nunes and Valentina Shevchenko simply looked untouchable. And we were on this show and we were saying, the only fight to make is that bring them two together again. Make the trilogy fight, make it a catch weight. What can we do to make these weight divisions interesting with two so dominant champions? Well, not having that conversation anymore. One of them hasn't even got a belt anymore. Amanda Nunes has got to prove it all over again. I tell you what, Aldana is chomping at the heels for an opportunity. I think it's been brilliant for women's MMA. And I really, I'm like Mike. I'm a big fan of Aldana. And I tell you what, the old boxing days, if this is a stand-up match, if this plays out on its feet, I've got Aldana with those hands mm -hmm. all day. Listen, we'll talk about how this stylistically matches up, Mike, but I just want to quickly get into the psychology of Irene Aldana because obviously when your world title opportunity came, it came 
as a replacement opponent. And I know that she's had a little mm. bit longer than you have, best part of a month. But has that mm. kind of played, do you think, into her favour that she hasn't had to overthink it? It's straight in and away we go. I mean, it all depends on the individual, of course, but generally, yes, you know, because a real danger in mixed martial arts is overtraining. And certainly when you've got the biggest fight of your career and it's against somebody like Amanda Nunes, who's so accredited, the two-weight division champion, the, the easy trap to fall into is to just go crazy, push it to the limit every single training session for 10 weeks, 12 weeks, whatever. Listen, if she's a professional, which she is, she's had a great career, she's improving every single fight, she's got a great team behind her as well, she'll have been staying in the gym, she'll have been staying fresh, she'll be working on a skill set, and then four or five weeks, that is plenty of time and you're not, you can't overthink it. So listen, stylistically, I, I do think it's a tougher fight than Juliana Pena with respect to Pena. She's a good grappler, but she, she's pretty sloppy on the feet and she telegraphs her shots, but she's a very effective fighter. Nonetheless, Aldana, she's clinical. She's a great boxer. She's coming off the back of two strong defeats. She's won four out of her last five. She's beaten some, beaten some great competition against Macy, Macy Chasson last time out. I think it was the up kick. Before that, she stopped Yana Santos with a beautiful left hook in a fight that she was just picking her apart. She's well balanced. She's got great power. As I said before, she's big for the weight class and on the ground as well. She can hold her own. I mean, I think every single time uh, Macy Chasson was taking her down, straight away she turned it into a submission threat. She got taken down. She turned it to a belly f belly down arm bar. She almost finished that. She went for triangles. You know, she's a very, very well-rounded, confident and big lady for this weight division. And that's the key thing, isn't it, Nick? Size. Because she is big, but she's very, very capable, as you were just about to point out, on the feet. Yes, yeah, she is. But the size thing is really important because she hasn't made uh, Bantam weight, championship weight, since her defeat to Holly Holm in Abu Dhabi. That was 2020. And that's a long time. You know, Kunitskaya, fantastic performance, first round knockout. That was a, she missed weight in that fight. Then last time out against Macy Chasson, she wins that by uh, KO in round three. Um, and that was made a catchweight at 140. That was a prearranged catchweight contest. So that is a concern that she hasn't made championship mm. weight in such a long time. But you're right. Listen, this is the moment she's been waiting for her entire career. There's no reason to believe she isn't going to be completely focused this weekend. She's going to step on no scales on Friday. I do believe that's the first battle for her. But when she gets inside that octagon, she's got absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain. She's 35 years of age. Chances are this opportunity isn't going to come again. She thought she was going to have to go through Raquel Pennington first to get this opportunity. Obviously, with the uh, rib injury to Pena, the opportunity has come a little bit sooner. But again, on the feet, with the hands, she's so big, she's strong. It's all about the takedown defense. It's all about a tight guard. And it's all about not respecting Amanda Nunes too much in the opposite side of the octagon. Just going for it. Roll the dice. That's what she's got to do. Mike, how impressed were you with Nunes last time out in the comeback fight against Peña? Because a lot of people started questioning her from the first defeat and they started thinking to themselves, as the greatest started to slide, is she on her way out? Well, she bounced back and proved that she's a true champion in getting that belt back. Yeah, and look, listen, to answer that question, I think it's more a case of that first fight with Juliana Pena, it was a terrible fight. It was a bad performance. Call it what you will, a bad night at the office. She, a bad night at the office, let's put it down to that. It was bad. They both just stood there toe-to-toe, -to -toe, slugging it out, throwing not impressive punches until one of them fell, and that was Amanda Nunes. Now, there's a whole storyline that maybe she was still sick and things like that, whatever. She rebounded in style. Last time out against Pena, she she was a sniper. She picked her apart. She dropped her so many times. Seemingly every time she yeah. connected, she put her down. Of course, Pena's tough. That's why she's here. That's why she's one of the best in the world. She's not the cleanest striker, but she's tough and she's got an iron will. But Pena, sorry, pardon me, Nunes, almost beat it out of her on many occasions. There was a few times there where the referee could have stopped the fight, but she would just always insert herself or she would always move just enough to, for the referee not to stop it. Against Alrini Aldana, it's a different kettle of fish altogether. I think Nunes, and I think this will always be the case, has the bigger power. You know, she's an incredibly strong lady. I mean, look at that fight with Chris Cyborg back in the day. I mean, that was just a phenomenal couple of minutes of just all-out action between two of the hardest hitters that we've ever seen in women's mixed martial arts. 
So I think Nunes has the power advantage. But when you look at the way Aldana moves, she's on, she's on balance, she's poised, she's got great movement, she's taller, only by one inch. I think she's got the longer reach as well. A lot of straight shots, a lot of movement, and essentially try and turn it into a boxing match with great takedown defense. If she could do that, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, we might see an upset here, boys and girls. Just throwing it out there. Listen, wouldn't put it past with the rise of Mexican MMA right now. You wouldn't put it past Irene Aldana being able to pull this off, would you? Against one of the best to ever do it. Really looking forward to this main event as Amanda Nunes defends. Like I said at the start of this, in a 12th straight championship fight. That's absolutely crackers. Uh, taking on Irene Aldana. The core main event, gentlemen. Check this out. Lightweights are on deck. We've, of course, been speaking about Benil Darius for a long period of time. When is he going to get his opportunity? You would think that this is the opportunity. This is the fight that if he can come through, propels him into championship class, taking on the former champion, Charles Oliveira. And what a fight for Charles Oliveira to be taking off the back of a defeat, Mike, to Islam Makhachev. Oh, listen, this is the one. Let's go. I can't wait for this fight. <laughs> This has been a long time coming. Benil Dariush has served his, uh, he's paid his dues, he's served his time, he's beaten the names, he's done the job every single time he's out there. Okay, and he's beaten some of the best fighters in the world. Uh, and now, because I had him on my podcast last week, he said that he's been guaranteed from the UFC. If he beats Charles Oliveira, he gets the title fight. So this is a big, big one. It's a big one. And it's a big one for Charles Oliveira. You know, and I think this is the people's main event. Of course, the main event, it's a special fight. Amanda Nunes, 13th straight title fight or 12th. Uh, that's amazing. That's legendary. But this one, I think, is what people are really, really looking forward to as well. So uh, it's an interesting one because both men are exceptional grapplers. You know, of course, Charles Oliveira had that crazy run. 12 fights, I think 11 stoppages, beating some legendary fighters, Gagey, Poirier, uh, became the champ, you know, against Michael Chandler. Every time he stepped in there, it was a fight of the night. Every time he stepped in, it's like, wow, how, what is this guy doing? The run that he was on was crazy. I even, I even got attacked very, very viciously because I suggested, hold on a minute, if he beats Islam Mahachev, maybe this is the greatest lightweight we've ever seen. I'm still getting abused online to this day for saying <laughs> that. But that's how good his run was. So Charles Oliveira coming into this one is going to be extremely motivated as he still got it. Was that just a moment in time? Or will he go out there and do what he did and beat Benil Dariush? It's going to be a sensational fight. I cannot wait. I think those that are obviously... Pure MMA fans know just how good these two guys are. But Nick, from a mainstream point of view, do you think we're actually talking about two guys who are seriously, seriously underrated and undervalued of how good they actually are in this division? I think these are two of the most undervalued fighters across the entire sport. Never mind this, even this weight division. You know, Charles Oliveira, as Mike just said then, been there, done it, wore the T-shirt. You know, he's got the record for the most finishes in the UFC, the record for the most submissions in the UFC and he's still only 33 years of age. People don't realize that Charles has been around forever, but he's actually the younger man going into this fight. You know, Darius is a year older than him, which is crazy. But again, Darius has been the guy knocking on the door at lightweight. That seems forever. You know, nobody would take him on. He just didn't seem to get that opportunity to get a, you know, a top five or six guy, which would ultimately torpedo him towards the title shot. Of late, it's like, right, he's lined up to fight Islam Makachev. Another fight gets cancelled. Islam Makhachev goes and fights for the title. He's fight. He's supposed to fight Charles Oliveira in 2020. The Oliveira pulled out of the fight. He was supposed to fight Oliveira uh, in May this year. The fight got pushed back again. And it's like, will his opportunity ever come? Because we know the talent's there. You know, anyone that earns a black belt in five years of stepping onto the jiu-jitsu match, that's how long it took him from white belt to black belt, just five years. That's phenomenal. That's when you know you've got a special kind of martial artist. And it's just taking him time for his hands to catch up. And now you see it when he's inside the octagon. Darius now is a complete fighter and he carries the confidence of a complete fighter. His hands are strong. His stand-up is deadly. He's putting people away. And when he gets them on the ground, he's choking them out. These are two of the best guys, period. I think it's a sensational fight. And listen, as you just say, Darius is this, this one win away. And Oliveira, he can start his campaign to get his title back with a big win over Darius. It's a big psychological test, isn't it, for Charles Oliveira, Mike? Because off the back of the way that the title fight with Islam Makachev 
went and off, the, off a great run that he'd been on up until that point, this is a big psychological test to see if he can bounce back and still compete at the very, very highest level. Yeah, but the reality is he's done this many times before. Remember, and, I, and yeah. I'm not saying this, that there, there was a theory out there that Charles Oliveira was a quitter. And sadly, the way that it ended against Mahachev kind of reignites that conversation, which is nonsense, okay? Mahachev is something special. Uh, and he lost fair and square. He, the man went on a sensational run, but he's lost fights before. The point that I'm making is that, yeah, he's, he's been there before and he's come back, okay? And it wasn't like he got knocked out cold. The man's been doing jiu-jitsu forever, you know? And when you look at what Oliveira has been through, remember there was a time when he was told he would never walk. He was told when he was younger mm. that he would never, ever play sports, you know? And now look at the man. He became a champion of the world and defended it several times. So bouncing back from getting submitted to Mahajev, I think mentally it will not be a hurdle. I think one of the real hurdles and the real talking points of this fight is Benil Dariush. Is he truly the elite, because I'm looking at his wins here. And listen, I am not disrespecting his opponent. Mataj Gamra, I mean, he looked like the next big thing. Um, mm. You know, with that fight he had with Armand Sarouk, was phenomenal. He's had a great rise. Struggled a little bit with Jalen Turner, you know, and, and mm. uh, in terms of taking him down and controlling him. And Jalen Turner is a sensational fighter, but he's not a grappler, you know, like a Charles Oliveira or a Benil Dariush. Uh, but Benil, you know, was able to beat him. But, but you know... Then it was Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson is kind of on the downslide, and I say that with respect. Carlos Diego Ferreira, good win. Scott Holzman, Drakkar Close. The point I'm making is it isn't Dustin Poirier, is a Makachev, just engaging Michael Chandler. But what yeah. is the disparity? When you get from five to ten, is there a difference? We don't know because that's yeah. kind of the guys that benil has been beating. So this fight will answer a lot of questions. But if he does beat Charles Oliveira, he gets to fight for the belt. Does Charles... I don't know about that. But I, if, you, if you speak to Benil, he's very confident he has him beaten everywhere. He says, Charles makes a lot of mistakes. He says, that's why he's so exciting because he puts himself out there. He walks people down. Uh, but he says that he feels, Benil, that Charles's jiu-jitsu isn't that good. He said, it's just opportunistic. He hurts people and then he jumps on them. I'm like, bro, <laughs> he's got the most submissions in <laughs> UFC history. What are you talking about? But Benil is very good. He says, when I look at his game, he, he's not that good, but he just takes advantage of opportunistic moments when his opponents are hurt. His words, not mine. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I would love some of that uh, Charles Oliveira jiu-jitsu in my life, mate, if it's not that good. He is, <laughs> he is a, he's, he's a different level. But I was just about to allude to that as well, Nick. From an excitement level, fans absolutely love watching Charles Oliveira because it's not just the manner of winning. It's the way he wins or even loses. It's always, always exciting. This cannot fail to disappoint. Yeah, and listen, Dariush is an exciting fighter as well. You know, he's, he, he kind of earns his trade inside the, inside the UFC. I remember being cage side in Abu Dhabi long time before Fight, Fight Island was ever coined the phrase and he lost to Ramsey Nijim. That was the early days and, and sitting down with Rafael Cadero then and him saying to me, listen, one guy, this guy will be champion of the world. Believe me, stick with him. And, you know, he's he's basically one more win away from a title opportunity now. But I think over time, Darius has become a fan favourite as well. I think Darius is a little bit of a, OK, he's underappreciated, but I think fans realise the talent that he's got. And you can also see how the stand-up game has caught up with the grappling side of things. Both these guys are willing to take chances on their feet because they're so strong on the ground. They're quite happy to be taken down. They're quite happy to be on bottom if need be because their jiu-jitsu game is so strong. That allow that gives them a different kind of freedom on their feet to land big, exciting things. Now, both guys can be knocked down. Both guys can be hit. But again, it's just that element of entertainment which makes this fight so attractive. I, I wish it was five rounds. I don't think it would last five rounds, but mm. I wish it was scheduled for five rounds because this is a main event on any card anywhere in the world, in my opinion. And it just makes it a fantastic co-main event out in Canada. No, absolutely. Listen, the men and co-men event have grabbed all our attention, but when you do go to these local places like Vancouver and Canada, you do need a little bit of local talent just to just to spruce it up a little bit and get the uh, decibel levels going to the next level for the fans that are going to be in attendance. And Mike Mallett has that opportunity. He's going to be carrying uh, a lot of local attention going into his fight uh, with Adam Fugit, Mike. 
I'm, I'm anticipating something quite special. Even though for the mainstream that are listening and watching our show, they might not know those two names. When you have a local fighter fighting in a local zone with a local fan base behind him, expect fireworks. Yeah, look, listen, Mike Malott, 9-1. and one. one loss was to Hakeem Dawadu years ago outside of the UFC. Right now, he's on a great win streak. Came through the contender series, submitted his opponent very, very quickly. The guy shot on him, snatched up a guillotine. Then he fights Mickey Gall on UFC 273. If you remember that fight, he made short work of Mickey Gall. And then last time out again, got a finish inside the first round against Johan Linnaeus. So this man's coming into this one, riding a good win streak, full of momentum, who would be the hometown favourite going up against Adam Fugit who fights out of Team Alpha Male. Solid fight, honestly. The name value, these are stars on the rise. This is a big opportunity on a massive pay-per-view like this. You know, someone's going to win. A star will be born. And Mike Malott, I'm telling you, I like what I've seen from this guy so far. Nick, two guys that people do know a little bit about is Dan Ige and Nate Lanway. Uh, Nate, obviously, is the uh, promo cut specialist. He loves to get on that microphone and absolutely rinse every man and his dog. Will he get that opportunity? Because Ige stopped the slide last time out and he's looking for more action this time in Vancouver. Yeah, it's a weird one because Ige started in the UFC like a, a freight train. You know, he was 6 and 0. Oh. Everyone was talking about Danny Gay. He was the future of the vision. Is he going to go make a move for it? And now he's at a little bit of a roadblock. He can't string two wins together. I think his current form is two wins against four losses. And he's kind of on the slide a little bit, you could argue. And then the flip side of that is you've got Nate coming. He's coming to the UFC. Only won one of his first three fights. And oh, okay, middle of the road guy. What's going to happen with him? Since then, he's gone 3 and 0. Oh. Every single one of them have been bonuses, and he keeps cutting these incredible pro roles <laughs> when you give up, put a microphone in her face as well. I think it's a fantastic fight. I think the thing with Nate, he's done it outside of the UFC. He was an M1 global champion in Russia. For an American to go and base himself with a Russian promotion and win a title out in Russia and defend it out there shows that the guy's got certain type of minerals. So you knew he was going to put it together. Right now, he's putting it all together. Is it the right fight at the right time to take on Number 13 ranked Dan Ige. We're certainly going to find out on Saturday night. But for Ige, listen, you've had your opportunities. You've, you've faced guys above you in the rankings. You've come a little bit short. Now you've got to defend your position. And there's a lot of pressure on Dan Ige here. This is a guy that's been used to headlining cards, albeit fight nights, albeit apex events. But Dan Ige has been used to being top of the tree. Now he's on a main card. He's defending his position. The pressure is absolutely on D Dan Ige right now. But Listen, is all four of his losses have come against top ten guys. But when someone out that rankings is trying to chip at your uh, chip away at your position, that becomes some a completely different type of pressure. Nate Landwehr is, I'm telling you, he is a star in the making. You know, you could say he's kind of cut from the Colby Covington cloth. Okay, but mm, I don't uh -huh. think he, the, the man's authentic. Okay, maybe Colby's an act. We don't know. That's what they say. Nice guy, but pretends to be a jerk. Uh, Nate Landwehr, I love this guy. I love the way he fights. I love what he brings to the table. I love the way when he's fighting. One of his fights, a couple of fights ago, he had full side control. He was dominating his opponent in San Diego. And then he just gets up because he's like, no, <laughs> let's give the fans a treat. He gets up and he's like cheering to the crowd. He would take him down again and get full mount. He'd stand up again. He's just an absolute <laughs> madman in the best possible way. He's out of his mind yeah. on the microphone. He's a nice guy. He works hard. He's got great solid skills. And I'm telling you, the man is a promo machine, as you said. He's a huge star in the making. But this is a real fight against Dan Ige. This is a big step up. Dan Ige, as you said, Nick, he has struggled with the form kind of recently. Rebounded last time. I got a really quick one-punch knockout. Black belt skills, great wrestling, you know. Is it the start of the decline of Dan Ige or is it going to be the rise of Nate Landwehr? We don't know. A lot of questions will be answered, but I'm telling you, this one is my pick for fight of the night. It's going to be sensational. Ooh, he's going oh, for this one. Right, baby, okay, baby. Then. I thought you might go for these middleweights with Mark andre Barrio taking on Eric Anders, which kicks off this main card. Obviously, both guys coming off the back of decent performances last time out. Anders had a wonderful finish, and we have Barrio on the undercard of John Jones' return, didn't we? Again, a solid performance from him. What did you make of this middleweight contest, Mike? Yeah, look, listen, two big guys for the division, two powerful people, you know, two guys that, you know, they're not Israel Adesanya's when it comes to the striking side of things, but they're bruisers, you know what I mean? They're willing to stand in the pocket, they will trade shots. Eric Anders, the former football player, big guy, uh, willing to throw down. 
not the fastest, but he does have big power and he's rounding out all the rest of the skills. And Mark andre Barrio, the power bar, last time out against Julian Marquez. What a beatdown that was. You know what I mean? Kind of a close first round, both guys throwing down, but then uh, uh, Barrio just dirty boxed the head off it. Right, got him in the clinch, uppercuts, hooks, uppercut hooks, elbows, just a, a non-stop beat down until the referee had to step in and uh, stop the fight. Very, very impressive. Both men, you know, they, they've been there, done it. They've got the t-shirt, they've had wins, they've had losses, they've been disrespected, they've, they've won bonuses. So this is a big fight for both men. It's going to be a good one. Andre Barriol, uh, I think he might get the job done here, boys. <sighs> Uh, that's the main card for USC 289. Obviously, uh, the cherry on top of the cake is the title fight between Amanda Nunes and Irene Aldana. We know what's coming up for UFC 290. We're all extremely excited about International Fight Week and those two title fights that are on that card. But you will have seen recently uh, the UFC president, Dana White, making the big announcements for other cards that are coming up throughout the course of the summer going into the autumn. If you're watching in America, the fall. I've got you. Don't worry. Uh, UFC 291. You see what I'm doing then, Mikey? I'm just letting all I international listeners know that I've got like a little that. bit. I, my phone's American. You know what I mean? I type color, C-O-L-O-U-R. It nah, auto-corrects it to C-O-L-O-R. Right? I get abused mm. on mine. You're using terminology like fall. <laughs> Brace listen, yourself, lad. Be, listen, BT Sports. <laughs> We're international here, son. International. I am now going to go and head towards the king of Salt Lake City because he likes to remind us, Mike, every time uh, when there is a card that comes up from Salt Lake that he has mm. been there, he has seen knockouts be there, and he's seen, obviously, big key moments in UFC history. Salt Lake, Correct. on deck again. UFC 291. Nick Pete, talk me through this because the main event's ridiculous and the rest of the card, my word, it's an absolute joke. It could be the best card of the year so far. It certainly is shaping up to be the best card of the year so far. It's phenomenal, isn't it? And, you know, Justin Gaethje versus Dustin Poirier in that main event, over five rounds, absolutely phenomenal. I personally don't think it needs any kind of trinket attached to it, but the old BMF belt's been dusted off. I, I, I don't know what they've given Jorge Masvidal to relinquish him it. Maybe it's a brand new belt. I, I don't know, but the BMF belt has been dusted off. That's in the main event. The co-main event. Oof, That's the one. Alex Pejea stepping up to light heavyweight, taking on former champ Jan Blahovic is just absolute fire. We've seen what Blahovic did to Pejea's mate, Israel Adesanya, when he tried to make the step up, and now he gets to welcome the former middleweight champion up to light heavyweight. That can only end one way. No judges required. And then Tony Ferguson versus Bobby Green's on there. Paolo Costa's back on there. Mate, it's absolutely insane. Justin versus Dustin to the rematch five years in the making. Two of the most yeah. entertaining. Every time they, they fight with anyone else, it seems to be a fight of the year, right? So you know it's going to be fireworks. You guys can be a couple of haters, but I like the BMF belt, okay? It puts a little oh, bit of extra shine on it. It gives them some pay-per-view <laughs> points. They get to go home with a trophy, the company, man. okay? Where's the company, oh, man? the company, man. <laughs> Call me what you want. If you've stepped foot in there in that octagon, you risk your life blood, sweat and on, tears Mikey. in the Better actual Mikey. octagon. You're fighting but for your life. You want to go home with at least a little trophy. You know what I mean? Unless you're the champion <laughs> of the world. <laughs> you, you know, not everyone gets the Hall of Fame trophies that you see behind me. This is something for them to keep, to relinquish, to hand down to their children. They get pay-per-view points and it's the top of the pay-per-view between two of the most violent men that we have ever seen. Okay, so save your hatred, boys. <laughs> I'm down, Miss <laughs> No, listen, the fight's brilliant. Wasn't it's brilliant. Well, listen, as you just said, two of the most violent and entertaining men in the UFC. Why didn't we just do an all violence belt? Why did we have to bring out the BMF belt was brought in because one one. those two guys were BMFs, just two absolute bad so, mothers. Are you saying these guys Justin are two of the Dustin nicest on? guys in the? Yeah, because they're two absolutely lovely fellas. They've got out, but when they, they step they into the octagon and that guys. door closes and the referee says, "Bring it on, <laughs> all come violence. on!" We see all a change, violence. a switch flips. Okay, they go from daytime nice guy to nighttime naughty guy. Okay, <laughs> daytime nice guy, nighttime the naughty, naughty, belt. naughty there you guys. guys. <laughs> the naughty <laughs> belt. The naughty <laughs> belt. <laughs> Jesus Christ, just edit that bit out, boys. Oh my God. No, look, listen. Come the nice time, naughty, naughty belt. belt. I love that. <laughs>
<laughs> the nighttime naughty belt. Nobody wants that one. Nobody wants that. Right, you get the nighttime naughty belt. <laughs> get on the step. Get on the <laughs> Get on the uh, amazing. Step. Oh amazing. my god! And in total <laughs> contrast, <laughs> in total contrast, <sighs> gents, the nicest guy in the whole of mixed martial arts, Wonder Boy himself, Stephen Thompson, taking on Michelle Pereira. Did that when people ask you how good is this card? When you when you mention that fight and it's on the prelims, that's how stacked the card is. That is a sensational yeah, look, fight. It's a mental card. You've even got Derek Lewis on there. Listen, granted, he's, he's losing yeah. a little bit recently, but the man's a big star. He's main evented many fights. He's taken on Rogerio De Lima, Kevin Holland, Michael Chiesa. There's a, oh. a sensational welterweight bout. Tony Ferguson, Bobby Green. That's going to answer a lot of questions. Where is Tony Ferguson? Is he still a viable contender? I like the fact that he's stepped down a little bit. It's not a Chandler. It's not one of the top guys, but it's still a very solid fight. All of these fights are competitive. Co-main event, Pereira versus Jan. Whoever wins that gets a title fight next. Probably going to be Jan because of the wrestling. But still, whoever wins gets a title shot. This card from top to bottom. Yeah, I'll say best card of the year so far. There you go. UFC 291 with a nighttime naughty bell on the line. Can't wait for that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've oh. we've already had a little bit of a taste. Last time we all got together and had a bit to speak about, we spoke about 292, which was going to Boston, and obviously the main event, Aljamain Sterling and Sean O'Malley. Mike, I'm kind of liked the, the little bits of social media pop-ups, the, the back and forth, the little bit. Of, it's just adding to that little bit of spice for me. It was a spicy fight anyway. I was in all, already. But these two going back and forth on, online, just adding that little bit of an extra layer for me. Yeah, well, they don't like each other. In fact, on my podcast, I had both of them on recently and I was talking to Aljamain Sterling and it was a great conversation and I'm not plugging my podcast. Uh, it was a great conversation. Yeah, you are. Uh, yeah, you are. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, what yeah. happened was... Nick, do you have a podcast? Nick, do you have no, one? No, listen, listen, listen to me though. Nick. The conversation went on so long and, and from Aljamain Sterling, we saw like a real version of him, right? So the conversation went long and it ate into when the time when O'Malley was meant to start and my producer just flipped him on ah. and they were both on at the same time and O'Malley was okay. not happy. He thought we'd set him Oof. up. Do you know what I mean? He thought we'd to get him to talk a bit of crap. That's how personal... And that's how much they don't like each other. He didn't he didn't want to mm -hmm. even like consume the same airtime as him, so to speak. It's a sensational matchup. You know, we know Aljamain Sterling, he's got the wrestling. If you took down Henry Cejudo multiple times and he beat him, it's a tough one for uh, for for O'Malley. He's got the striking advantage. Aljamain's got the wrestling advantage. It's for the belt. It's been a long time coming for Sean O'Malley. It's been a slow, steady rise up in competition. He signed with the with the UFC via the content of what was that, 2018, 17 maybe? Many, many years in the making. He's improved all the way. On the ground, O'Malley's got black belt skills. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. And they don't like each other. Always makes it a bit spicy. Yeah, listen, we've got a big preview coming for that, obviously, when we get a little bit closer to that Boston card. Uh, 293, we're going to Sydney. We're going to Australia. Nick, main event, man. We've got to talk about the possibilities because we know that, obviously, Robert Whittaker's in the Drikas Duplessis fight. We kind of know, well, do we know where Israel Adesanya is going to go? Is it going to be Izzy for you? Would Izzy be the guy that you would have headline that card? Because he's already talking about wanting to come back and wanting to get active. Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be, hasn't it? It's got it's it's set up really for Adesanya to come back there. I think against who? Who do you Grasso, want him in there? That with? thing confirmed, yeah. Shevchenko Grasso. That could be interesting if that's that's not done yet. Has Jamal Hill got a date yet for his return? You know, these are all big fights. The Prohachka fight obviously is out there for him. Um, but yeah, listen, it's got to be the Izzy show, surely. And that then it's just about who is it in that weight division. I, I'm. I'm <clears throat> I still think Kamari Usman's got a run at middleweight in him. I really do. I, I don't think a, a shot against Adesanya is pal is going to happen anytime soon. But I, I'm still waiting to see what Kamari Usman decides to do in terms of his future. But Adesanya in Sydney, Australia, come on, it, it sells itself, doesn't it? What do you think, Mike? Well, listen. You yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got to be Israel Adesanya. He's one of the biggest stars in the sport. He's from New Zealand. He's represented that part of the world so well, and they're going back there for another pay per view. He is a natural, logical match. And even though Whitaker said, you know, because let's be honest, there's a very, very strong chance that Whitaker wins that fight against Duplessis. And he said that he doesn't want to turn around that quickly, if I'm not mistaken. You never know. We might still see Whitaker versus Adesanya 3. That would oh, be the dream main event. 
because be because he, he's from Sydney. Uh, Izzy represents the whole Anzac kind of region of the world. That would be the one. That would the tickets would fly off the shelf, and it would be a sensational fight. We got to throw Taito Avasa on there. Obviously, he <laughs> never fought in Perth. He never fought in Perth because he wanted a little bit of time off. You know what I mean? Because he'd had a busy busy schedule. So tied to a Varsar on there. We get Robert Whittaker versus Izzy. Jack Della Maddalena. Come on. I mean, I, I can't wait for it, but it's it's Izzy. It's got to be Izzy, 100%. And if not a Whittaker, then find someone. It doesn't always have to be. We can find a fun matchup for him, maybe somebody from 205. Maybe, you know, like Anderson Silva back in the day had a couple of fights at 205 against Stefan Bonner and James Irving, simply because people mm. wanted to see Anderson fight. So, yeah, I don't know who it will be, but my money, my best guess, is Will Adesanya in the main event. Uh, lots to talk about. Great summer ahead. And obviously going into that autumn period, some fantastic UFC cards to get extremely excited about, all starting with UFC 289 in Vancouver and Nunes versus Aldana. I'm sure you're going to be locked into that uh, this weekend. Don't forget, it all gets underway. Those prelims from 1 a.m. in the morning uh, with the main card from 3. Dan Hardy has done a full breakdown of that main event as well, telling you the keys to victory, picking out the strengths and weaknesses of both fighters. And of course, I'm sure it's not passed you by. Yes, tough is back, the ultimate fighter. And we do have it on BT Sport. It's available for you now on Catch Up. Team McGregor versus Team Chandler. Go and check it out. Uh, we'll be back for a weigh-in show for UFC 289, and then we'll get stuck into the review of what goes down in Vancouver. So make sure you come back and join us for that. Until then, enjoy the fights. <laughs> 